morning open door. If you're a guest with us today, we're very grateful you're here as well as we celebrate what we call Whole Life Emphasis Sunday. It's something that we do once a year uh, here at Open Door. Um, Pastor Duane, you may know, is on his way to Hawaii, where his daughter will be married later this week. Uh, today, he's with our church plant in San Diego. We'll preach for them and visit with them and encourage them. So uh, be praying for the Hill Church in San Diego this morning and Pastor Duane as he uh, preaches there. Um, next week, we'll start a new sermon series in the book of Luke. Pastor Ryan will kick that off for us, and then Pastor Duane will be back in the pulpit on the 29th. So we're looking forward to that. <clears throat> My name is Mark Armstrong, and I serve as the executive pastor here at Open Door. Uh, today has been set aside as Whole Life Emphasis Sunday. In previous years, Open Door has celebrated an annual Sanctity of Human Life Sunday in January, as well as a Sunday in November to observe Orphan Sunday. These were important Sundays in the life of our church where we call the church to stand up for the unborn and for the orphan, those whose existence is being threatened and who cannot advocate for themselves. Last year, we began to incorporate them into a broader category that we call whole life emphasis, which is based on our commitment to a whole life ethic. In defining what we mean by whole life ethic, let me start by defining the word ethic. In general, ethics is the practical application of our internal convictions. As humans, our attitudes and actions are motivated by our belief about something. For unbelievers or non-Christians, their convictions may be based on science, emotion, or tradition. But for Christians, our convictions should be informed by God's word, which serves as our ultimate authority for understanding and interpreting the world around us. It can be helpful to think of ethics in terms of this formula. Your stated belief plus your actual practice equals your actual belief. If we say we believe something, but we act contrary to it, do we really believe it? Or if we say we believe something, but our words are not followed by action, do we really believe what we say we believe? Unfortunately, one of the greatest hindrances to the gospel is that for many people who call themselves Christians, their words and their actions are very different. This causes confusion and often results in contempt for Christianity. Christians should strive to have a consistent Christian ethic, where our beliefs about God are formed by the scriptures and then translated into sincere action. And today I want to challenge you to put your faith in action in some specific ways. So now that we have a working definition for ethics, let me explain what we mean when we say a whole life ethic. I think you are all familiar with the term pro-life. I believe that whole life is a more appropriate term in every society, there are segments of the population who have, who have been determined to have less value based on their perceived worth to the society. A whole life ethic is interested in protecting the life and dignity of all people, but especially those who have been marginalized by their culture. A fitting description for a whole life ethic could be pro-life for the whole life, since we believe that life begins in the womb and does not end until natural death. And our concern should be for everyone on that spectrum, the unborn all the way to the elderly. In addition to the unborn and elderly, a whole life ethic includes um, the, the following as well. Children and adults with special needs or ability, disabilities, vulnerable populations like the poor, orphans, widows, immigrants, and refugees. It includes important issues like human trafficking and racial reconciliation and mental illness. The video that played a few minutes ago reminds us that every life has value to God because every person is made in his image. And while we are all made in his likeness, we don't all look the same. And I believe, believe that that reality highlights both the beauty of diversity and the necessity of diversity. If God created us in his image, but with many differences, then those differences should be embraced and celebrated as beautiful and necessary according to his good plan. Yet there are subsets of the population whose differences are used against them to marginalize them or make them feel as though they're second class. This is usually based on the society's perception of their value. The more that you can contribute to society, the more valuable your life is. But this view is grossly flawed and short-sighted because according to Genesis 1.26, every person is made in the image and likeness of God, and therein lies our value. Yet, from the time sin entered the world, humanity has been dealing with the sin of favoritism. 
So today, as we consider the importance of living out a whole life ethic, the book of James has some very practical wisdom for us. James begins chapter 2 with a direct instruction not to show favoritism and offers a real-life scenario for the believers to consider. So if you brought your Bibles today, please look with me at James 2, or you can also follow along on the screen. And I hear that some of you third graders have some new Bibles that Mr. J gave you. So I hope you too will open up to check James chapter 2 and follow along with us. And if you're a third through fifth grader, welcome to our service. We have some sermon notebooks in the back on the table if you've not picked yours up yet. I think there's a few left back there. Uh, before we jump into these verses, let me give you some quick context about who James is writing to. James is writing to Jewish believers who have been scattered from Jerusalem due to widespread persecution. And he wanted to encourage them to stand on the wisdom from Scripture as they faced many trials and tests that were challenging their faithfulness to God. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Even in our own culture, it seems like yeah, our culture is becoming increasingly hostile to our Christian faith. And so it's important that we too heed James' advice and not lament these trials, but see them as op opportunities for us to grow in our maturity in Christ. When James opens his letter, he challenges his readers to view trials as opportunities to grow rather than obstacles to complain about. He asserts that every trial we, we overcome helps us mature as Christians. Enduring them makes our faith and relationship with our Savior that much stronger. And the mark of a mature believer is that we put our faith into action. I want to pose a question to you today. Is your life characterized by a living faith? An outline I'll use today is living faith is rooted in Jesus. Living faith promotes mercy and living faith takes action. Let's look again at verses 1 through 4. James says, My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes also comes in, if you look with favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and say, Sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor person, Stand over there, or sit here on the floor by my footstool. Haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The Jewish Christians that James was writing to were very likely living in a very prejudiced age, filled with bias and hatred based on class, ethnicity, nationality, religious background. In the ancient world, people were routinely and permanently categorized because they were Jew or Gentile, slave or free, rich or poor, even male or female. But a significant aspect of the work of Jesus was to break down those barriers, the walls that divided humanity, and to bring forth, one new, bring forth one new race of mankind in him, as we see in Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. The unity and openness of the early church was shocking to the ancient world. But this unity didn't come automatically. As this command from James shows, the apostles had to teach the early church to not show favoritism. The glorious faith of the Lord Jesus Christ was not to be corrupted by partiality. As brothers and sisters in the faith, we are to imitate the faith of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And as we do, we will lose all prejudice and learn to treat others with grace and fairness, regardless of any worldly differences that might otherwise separate us. Our mutual love for Christ allows us to celebrate our differences. It's also helpful to understand that partiality can be against someone or it can be for someone. We can be partial toward people who are like us or have something to offer us, and we can be partial against someone who's different than us. But both types are wrong because the basis for judgment is selfish motives. Now, before you convince yourself that you don't struggle with the sin of favoritism, I want to challenge you to pay closer attention to yourself this week. I hope it's true that you don't struggle with favoritism in any explicit way, but don't overlook the favoritism that's often subtle. As I've been thinking about this topic for the last few weeks, I've been disappointed in myself about how quickly I can make an assessment of someone. You see them uh, walking across the street or walking across the parking lot at Walmart or sitting beside us at work or school. We often make assessments of people based on first sight. But we're to leave the judging to Christ, because as James makes clear in verse 4, our judgments lead to evil thoughts. But Christ's judgment is based on the heart and not merely outward appearance. 
So let's pray that our favoritism will break our hearts and that will and will lead us to repentance. Students, let me address you for a minute. Whether you're in elementary school or middle or high or even beyond, I want you to know that Jesus spent a lot of time and gave a lot of attention to the outcasts of society, including his own disciples. He wasn't looking for the most popular people to hang out with, but rather he showed concern for tax collectors, adulterers, the disabled, and the poor. So whether at school or in extracurricular activities, your neighborhood, or even here at church, let me encourage you to do your best to show everyone the compassion of Christ by the way you treat them. Don't try to fit in, but instead love like Jesus loved. I can guarantee that being popular is not nearly as cool as being Christ-like. Here at Open Door, we often hear that we are a friendly church, and of course, that's a compliment. But shouldn't every church be friendly? You would hope so, but really it's not the case. If we really want to represent Christ to our community, every guest should feel warmly welcomed. And that's part of what our Connections team is, is assigned and designed to do, uh, to assist people in finding the right class for their kids, or the bathrooms, or the worship center, or a cup of coffee. I think we, I think we do a pretty good job of that. But it can't stop there. I would hope that each of you would go out of your way to make someone you don't know feel right at home here at Open Door. Introduce yourself. Let them know you're glad they're here. Invite them to sit with you. Invite them to your care group. Maybe you would even invite them to lunch after the service. That's the kind of hospitality that really represents our Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope we would all be grieved if we heard that someone visited us and didn't feel welcome. So please help us greet our guests in that way. And uh, I, know, I know our church is, is larger, and I don't expect that you would know every member and be able to distinguish between members and guests. So members, don't be offended if somebody comes up to you and asks you if you're a guest. Um, but let's just go out of our way to make everyone feel welcome. <clears throat> but there is one clue you can look for. There's a number of people in the room, even now, that have a, a brown paper gift bag. Uh, and that likely means that they're visiting with us for the first time or the second time. And so look for those bags and, and uh, make sure that you engage those folks and thank them for being here today. We would appreciate your help in doing that. Moving on to verses 5 through 7, James says, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Yet you have dishonored the poor. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into court? Don't they blaspheme the good name that was invoked over you? The earliest Christians were also tempted to treat wealthy believers better than poorer ones. In the community that James is addressing, the rich were often given preferential treatment by these Jewish Christians, even though the rich were often the ones who persecuted the church. At the time of his writing, the original audience was not responding to their trials in a way that reflected true faith. Far from honoring all believers, no matter their wealth or social status, the audience was giving greater respect to the rich. And while we cannot be sure of why this was the case, perhaps the Jewish Christians were hoping that their honor of the wealthy believers would persuade the rich, persuade the rich to help bring an end to their persecution. Even though some of the poor were heirs of the kingdom, they were actually brothers and sisters in the faith, they were still dishonored because they were poor. James wanted the believers to see the hypocrisy in this kind of action. The very people who were oppressing the believers are the ones that are being honored. And this highlights another example of how showing favoritism leads to evil thoughts. It's often selfishly motivated. We might ask ourselves, what can I gain from having a relationship with a certain person? Or do they have something that I want or need? And while we don't usually do this consciously, Subconsciously, this thought may occur to us as we consider how to relate to people who are not like us. And this isn't pleasing to God because it dishonors people by not promoting equality and by ignoring the dignity of every person that's made in the image of God. Because Jesus showed compassion for all people, we should do the same. If our faith is truly rooted in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, it should be without judgment and full of compassion. So living faith is rooted in Jesus, but living faith also promotes mercy. Looking to verses 8 through 13, James says, Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as you, yourself, then you are doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 
For whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you're a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James doesn't mince words here in verse 9. If you show favoritism, then you've committed sin. He can say this with confidence because showing partiality goes directly against the royal law. It's the opposite of the great command to love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, the first part of that great command is to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. Having a sincere love for God is what enables us to have a sincere love for all people since they are made in his image. And this is the cure to our prejudice. When talking here about the law, James is not saying that salvation rests on our ability to keep the law. We can't keep it perfectly. What James is doing is reminding the Jewish believers that even if they kept all the other laws, they were still sinning because they were showing favoritism, and that makes them guilty of the whole law. In Christ, we are judged by the law of freedom. Nevertheless, we must be concerned with obedience to God's commands for it's in our obedience that we show that we possess real saving faith. To be clear, we can never be saved by our good works, but they are evidence that our faith is real. James encourages the believers to speak and to act according to their faith in Christ. The wonderful thing about the Bible is that it helps us see what we should look like as Christians. It helps us to know who God is, but it also helps us to know who we are to be. God's given us the picture and we're to keep adjusting taking off certain things and adding certain things until we get it right, which will be a lifetime of adjustment. For those of us who are followers of Christ, we have been shown an incredible amount of mercy, even when our sin and our rebellion deserve judgment. But Jesus stood in our place and he took God's wrath instead. That's incredible mercy. And having received it in abundance, we are obligated to show it to others. So in the way that you live your lives, let it be said of you that mercy triumphs over judgment. And by doing so, we are continuing to show our amazement at the grace of God in our own lives. We deserve judgment, but he gives us mercy through Christ. I want to take this opportunity to say that if you have not placed saving faith in Christ, then you are still under the judgment of God. At the end of this life, you will face his faith face his wrath because you're guilty of breaking his law. But please hear me say that the mercy of God is available to you as well if you will believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and turn from your sins. Listen to these incredible verses from Ephesians 2 that speak of the mercy of God. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages we might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift. Not from works, so that no one can boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So please consider your need for saving faith in Christ, and we'd be glad to tell you more about how you can experience that if you'll talk to us after the service. And church, I hope you took note of verse 10, where Paul also makes a connection between faith and works. Our faith in Christ is what saves us, but saving faith is expected to produce good works. It's part of God's good plan for our lives. So Paul and James are in agreement here. So with gratitude to God, who has shown us mercy in abundance, May our lives demonstrate an abundance of mercy to others. So living faith is rooted in Jesus. Living faith promotes mercy. And then living faith takes action. Looking at verse 14 through 17, James says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? 
In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. How do we know if someone is serious about a commitment they make? There's usually some kind of follow through. They put feet to their words. Our faith should be no different. If we say we have faith, but we lack follow through, then our faith can be called into question. A living faith will put itself into action. On the other hand, giving a blessing to someone in need without offering tangible aid is useless, according to James. Gospel-centered lives are characterized by love for God that translates into love for other people. To show love requires that we take action. As I was thinking about this truth, the phrase love is a verb popped into my mind, and before I knew it, I was singing the old DC talk song, Love is a Verb. I don't know if any of you guys remember that or if I'm dating myself, but love was spelled L-U-V because that's the more cool way to spell it, I guess. But I was intrigued, and so I Googled the phrase love is a verb, and I was honestly surprised that there are a lot of songs and a lot of books written on the topic. I think I was surprised because it seems like our culture tends to promote love as a feeling when you don't feel it anymore. You move on to something else. Yet the Bible makes clear to us that love isn't passive. It's not merely a feeling or an emotion. God doesn't just love us from afar by sending us warm and fuzzy feelings. Instead, he created us to enjoy a relationship with him. And as we read through the Bible from beginning to end, we can see that his love was demonstrated to his children in very tangible ways. He related personally to Adam and Eve and created a beautiful garden to serve as their home. When they rebelled, he allowed them to experience serious consequences, but he promised that redemption would ultimately come through a Messiah. He guided his children through the Exodus and eventually settled them in the Promised Land. He lovingly disciplined them when needed, and he provided for all of their needs. He used the prophets to warn, of, to warn folks of his coming judgment and to communicate truth. And the greatest act of love was that he sent his only son, Jesus, to be our substitute so that we wouldn't have to face his wrath. That is love in action. And in the life of Jesus, we see the same kind of tangible love for the people that he encountered. The Gospels give us many examples of how Jesus showed genuine concern for those who were the least in society. Uh, We see Jesus uh, interacting with lepers, the lame and sick, prostitutes, tax collectors, widows and children. Jesus spent time ministering to these people who were outcasts in society, and he sets an example for us to follow. Remember that James, the author of these verses, was the half-brother of Jesus, so he would have been an eyewitness to Jesus' compassion towards others, and it seemed like it had a great influence on James. And for James to share examples of caring for orphans and widows in chapter 1 and not dishonoring the poor here in chapter 2 is probably something he learned from Jesus himself. James has chosen examples that highlight our our responsibility to help people who are in need as an expression of our true faith. When you encounter someone who has a need, what do you do? Helping our friends and family probably comes a little more naturally to us. There are people in need all around us. Do you take notice? Are you concerned? Are you willing to sacrifice your time and resources to show them the love of Christ? Are you willing to step outside of your comfort zone in order to minister to them? The example that James provides here in verses 14 and, and 15 and 16 is someone in need of food and clothing. It seems that someone that encounters them recognizes the need and responds with mere words, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed. James seems to assume that the passerby had the means to meet the need but didn't. I don't know if their words were intended to be a prayer blessing or just well wishes, but in either case, it fell short of real, practical help and probably was taken as an offense. And so James says, what good is it if we don't actually give them what they need? You might ask, what about praying for them? Wouldn't that be the same as taking action? I would agree in part, but consider that to offer prayer is to recognize the need not take steps to meet the need calls into question the sincerity of our faith. Our prayer should not be a substitute for action. More times than not, I think what God would require of us is to pray and to act. And while every act of kindness and generosity is important, let's not be quick to pat ourselves on the back because we make an annual contribution to a charity. 
While they benefit from our financial support, sometimes just giving our money is the easy way out. Maybe we should consider financial support along with another action step. Let's give our finances and our time. James concludes this section by stating in verse 17, in the same way faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Dead faith will not save anyone. But living faith, marked by good works, is what justifies us. Does that mean that every good deed is inspired by true faith? We know the answer to that is no. There are whole religions that are built on the premise of good works, but they are devoid of faith. But James makes clear that living faith will always be demonstrated in good works. Let me end where we began by reminding you of this helpful formula. Your stated belief plus your actual practice equals your actual belief. As believers, our lives are to be characterized by a biblical ethic. So, as you consider this formula again, I want to ask you if your faith is dead or is it alive? I've reworked the formula to make it more representative of the passage in James. And so let's think about it this way. Loving God plus loving others equals living faith. As you know, we like to end our worship services by commissioning our members to go with the gospel. That simple phrase is packed with a whole lot of meaning. For some of you, you you may think it means go with the gospel on your lips. Go and share the good news of the gospel with someone in word. And it does mean that. But it also means go and apply what you've heard. Go and live out the gospel. Put it into practice. In that way, we are demonstrating that our faith is living. It's easy to act like a Christian in this worship service. We sing, we pray, we fellowship, we take notes. But how does that affect us on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday and so on? Are you putting your faith into action as you live out the gospel during the week? Let me challenge you with these statements. If you say you value the life of the unborn, then what are you doing about it? If you say you value the life of a person with disabilities, then how are you enriching their lives? If you say you love the poor, how are you serving them? If you say that you have concern for the marginalized, what are you doing to champion their cause? And in what ways are you honoring the lives of our elderly population? There are many vulnerable populations in our society that need to be acknowledged and shown that they matter to Christ and to his church. As followers of Christ and as members of Open Door Church, let's be intentional to love these precious people in the same way that Jesus does. How wonderful would it be if, as our church continues to grow, that we get more and more diverse because we are loving all kinds of people with the gospel? I pray that that becomes true of us, and I invite you to help us make that happen. But it also needs to be true in our homes. Let's be intentional to open our homes to all kinds of people, not just those who look like us or have the same priorities or make us feel comfortable. If we really believe that every life has value, And let's put it into practice. Let's model this for the next generation. And because we want this to be true of Open Door Church, then we as leaders need to provide opportunities for you to put your faith into action while serving here. And I have a few opportunities for you to consider. As a care group, have some regular fellowship time with one of our international ministries. What a wonderful way to experience the beauty of diversity and to build some new friendships. Or you could serve at our food pantry. There's lots of ways to do that, from picking up food during the week uh, to making boxes on Friday night to distributing boxes on Saturday morning and engaging our clients. It's a great way to serve as a family or as a care group, and it really is a tangible way to meet a need and uh, to put yourself in the the shoes of our clients and to, to realize what it would feel like to have a food insecurity that plagues you day in and day out. Uh, We give you opportunities not just to take a box to them, but to engage with them, to get to know their names, to visit with them, to pray for them, uh, and to show them that they matter to us because they matter to God. You can sign up to serve through our website under the Connect tab if you have some interest in that. Orphan care and foster care are great ways to serve, and we're working to reestablish some partnerships with some adoption, foster, and orphan care ministries. This is an area of significance to me, and I want to make sure that we're doing our part to champion these causes. So stay tuned 
and we'll give you some more details about that. Human Coalition is a ministry that we've worked with for a number of years. It's a local pregnancy help clinic that supports men and women facing unplanned pregnancies. And there are a variety of ways that we'll ask you to partner with them throughout the year, but I hope that you took notice of an opportunity in your newsletter last week uh, about a virtual baby shower that we're hosting. Uh, one of their expectant moms, um, oftentimes they don't have the, the resources or the, or the support networks that they need in order to care for the child. Uh, you, you, those of you that have had newborns know that there's a lot of stuff that you need, and so we want to do our part to help support them in this way and show our appreciation to them for choosing life. And so look back to those details and consider how you might be involved. Love Life is another ministry that we've been a part of. It's a national ministry with a mission to unite and mobilize the church to create a culture of love and life that, re that will result in an end to abortion and the orphan crisis. Now, one of the ways that they do this is they host 40, week prayer, 40 weeks of prayer walks in different cities around the nation. They've been working in Raleigh. I think this is their fifth year, and we've been uh, a, a part of that as well. But I'd love to see our participation, our participation with them grow. Um, we offered to adopt two Saturdays this calendar year. One of them was back in April. I don't think we did a great job promoting that to you, uh, but I was there with a few other people, and, and as I was there, the thought occurred to me that every member needs to experience this. It's very non-confrontational. It's meant to just be a, really a prayer walk. And so what we do is we meet in a parking lot. Uh, we have a, a brief devotional. We'll get some instructions. Uh, we'll walk across another parking lot over to a, a um, grassy area that's across from an abortion clinic, and we'll just pray. Uh, we'll, many of the clients and the, the workers recognize the Love Life blue t-shirts, and so we hope that we're uh, just a, an encouragement in that way. Um, but to see people come and go, to see how the workers are um, standing on the street corner and jumping up and down with signs and pulling them in and just breaks your heart. It's evil. And so um, I hope that you will consider coming out on September 25th, which is the next Saturday that we are, are adopting a Saturday. And so um, look, look for more details. We'll be announcing that soon. And then lastly, I want to make sure that you understand and, and know about our LEAN ministry. LEAN stands for Loving and Equipping All Needs. It's our special needs ministry here at Open Door. And we believe that every person bears a sacred dignity of being made in the image of God. And those and that those individuals and families who have been touched by disability are indispensable to the life of the church and have a vital role to play and unique gifts to share. And as an adoptive parent of a child with special needs, this ministry is very dear to my heart. We want every child, regardless of their ability, to feel welcomed and wanted and to have the same access to discipleship and service that any other member has. And we want the same for their parents by providing a safe, and welcoming place for their child. I want to share a few statistics with you that are, that are hard, hard, to, hard to believe. Uh, but do you realize that families who are touched by disability are some of the most unchurched people in America? It's believed that 80% of families who are touched by disability in some way are unchurched. Now, we know some of those people just don't have interest in church, but too many of them would love to come to church but don't feel like there's a place for them. They've attempted to go to church and haven't feel, felt welcomed, and so they just decide that there's no place for them. And while churches should be the most accessible, they're often some of the least. Schools and businesses are often much more welcoming and, and accessible than churches are, and it shouldn't be the case. The church needs to embrace this as a much-needed part of our mission. And it starts with a desire to embrace children and adults with disabilities out of a genuine understanding, acceptance, and celebration of their lives. And I'm grateful that Open Door is doing their part to serve these families through our lean ministry. And I want to invite you to get involved. It takes a lot of volunteers to support the children and the families that we desire to serve in this ministry, mostly because oftentimes it's a one-to-one -one ratio in order to care for them properly, they need a, a hands-on person. And whether it's a buddy that, that assists them in attending a Sunday morning class or a WANA or a special needs classroom, or um, we would love to start hosting some respite nights. 
Um, and, and other ways that we would love to see the ministry grow would mean that we need more volunteers. And so consider how you might be involved. But not just that. I want you to know that the ministry exists so that when you engage people in the community, you can say, please come to our church. There's a place for you. But I do want to let you know of a real pressing need. You might know that Awana starts tonight, and we have one child in the ministry that would love to participate in Awana but needs a buddy. So as it is now, we have not been able to find a volunteer. So if you have interest in serving this child and giving them access to Awana tonight, please let me know. So in addition to the opportunities the Lord may bring to you in your own personal lives, I pray that you will also take advantage of some of these opportunities to put your faith into practice through serving others. Let me ask you this question again. Is your life characterized by a living faith? If our faith is truly rooted in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, it should be without judgment and full of compassion. To live out a whole life ethic is to live in such a way that promotes the beauty and dignity of every person. Let's be known for that in our community as we love God by loving others. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you loved us first. We thank you that you designed us to, to relate to you. We thank you that you instilled with us your image and your likeness. We're so grateful that we stand apart from the rest of creation in that way. God, I pray that we would, we would find our value in that, but that we would also show others in our community that they, they matter as well because they also are made in the image of God. Lord, help us to love like Jesus did. I pray that we wouldn't be worried about our reputation, that we wouldn't be worried about our comfort, but that we would go to those who need to experience the love of Christ and that we would offer it. We all know that we have received an abundance of mercy, not just once, but every day. And I pray that we would live out of that abundance, that we would show that same kind of mercy and compassion to those that we cross paths with. Lord, open our eyes even this week to the needs around us and then give us the faith that we need to meet those needs as you direct us. Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to gather this morning. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>